Arlene pointed at a central building. A small pillbox, structure right in the center of the monster convention. In all the chaos, none of the creatures had gotten anywhere near this pillbox, as if they deliberately avoided it. Could that be the power receiver? She asked. Rich shrugged. I don't know, but it seems like the best possibility. That possibility did as much for our morale as if we'd each been given a blue space sphere. The spider mind continued firing until many of the other creatures, its own troops, were killed or driven off. It was now or never. I jumped first, feeling as if I could fly. Arlene followed, and I turned to help, but she didn't need a hand. We both had to help Rich, who wasn't exactly constructed for flight. The three of us made a dash for the central building. Monster corpses presented a major obstacle, but we quickly turned grateful for the thick-limbed heavy bodies all over the floor. The spider mind noticed us and opened fire with its 30mm Vulcans. We hit the deck and used the bodies for cover. The incredible creature charged us, firing maybe 300 rounds a minute, 5 rounds a second. In a few moments it would be upon us, firing so rapidly we'd never be able to return fire. Suddenly, the firing stopped. The spider mind was tangled up in the bodies it had helped produce. The mechanical spider legs were not designed for an obstacle course. RUN! I shouted, heading for the building. A quick glance at the location of the spider mind told me what I needed to know. The angles were perfect. Get between the spider mind and the building! Move! I bolted hutward and immediately sprawled gracefully over the prone body of a steam demon. A steam demon! My heart leapt up in my throat. Then, I realized the damn thing was under bloody construction. Great, and me without my monkey wrench. A gigantic monster lay on its belly, face into the deck. The missiles were exposed, and as bullets flew haphazardly over my head, I swallowed hard. A couple of good shots might detonate the warheads on those puppies. Or, if the warheads weren't yet attached, the fuel cells could rupture and spray us all with caustic and flammable rocket fuel. Very adroit, Mr. Leslie, snapped Arlene, yanking me to my feet. We made tracks. We had crossed perhaps a third of the open territory, when a wave of horror struck me like a physical hammer blow. Nightmarish images of Degas, Bosch, Patrick Woodruff, blood dripping from the walls and ceiling, sprays of blood in the distance, blood from overhead sprinklers. It probed, trying to find a weak spot. My father lurched out of the building, grinning and slapping his body. Me heap big chief, Kamehameha! He shouted, then gave a Tarzan yell. He humiliated me all over again, as he had twenty years earlier. We'd been in Hawaii in a museum before a life-size, huge statue of Hawaii's greatest king. I shrank away from him, praying to God no one knew he was my father. But he followed me, saying, did you see what I did? Watch! And he did it again. I was never more ashamed of him in my life. We were lucky to make it out of the museum alive. But God damn it, he was not going to stop me reaching that building. I pushed on, tuning out the spider mind. Then I saw myself brought up on charges again. But this time I was tried and convicted and they ripped the stripes off my sleeve. Like, what was it? That old television show. Two-dimensional, branded, something like that. They tore off my sharpshooter's medal, my ribbons, finally the eagle and globe that told the world I was a marine. But I gritted my teeth, and through my tears I told myself that I knew I was a marine no matter what, and Arlene would never let me forget it even if I tried. My feet never stopped. God knows what horrors it sent to Arlene and Rich. Their faces were white, grim, but determined. 
The monstrosity realized it didn't have our number psychologically, and tried the more direct route. It opened a fire, but it was off balance, picking its way through the bodies, and the whole contraption tumbled over. This gave us the time to get into position. Just as we got behind the building, the spider mind freed itself, stood up straight on mechanical legs, swiveled the weaponry into position, and started firing. A few quick burps of gunfire probed our way, and then it abruptly choked off and there was silence. What happened? Rich asked. It's like it stopped automatically, Arlene said. It can't shoot us without shooting the building, I realized. The guns were clearly cut off by a circuit breaker. We had to get inside, but the spider mind lived up to its name. The thing scuttled quickly to the side, trying for a better angle and a clear shot. We kept moving, dancing around the pillbox in a tightening spiral, always keeping ourselves between the spider mind and the building. It was like playing some kind of children's game, only this playground was the killing field. Then we had a new problem. The other monsters had been considerate enough to stay away, but now the noise attracted them back into the fray. A random sampling of fireballs, ball lightning, and even the Hell Prince's green fire creased our bow. Under the circumstances, it would have been rude not to respond. We fired back while we kept running from the spider mind. One rocket left! I yelled as I fired the penultimate one at a minotaur. I slung the launcher. Never know when a weapon might come in handy. But Arlene must have figured there'd be no more rainy days. She blew through her AB-10 ammo and dropped the pistol without a second glance, not wanting anything to slow her down. Bill Rich fired his sig cow at the spinies and actually dropped one. Despite his bulk, he'd managed to keep up with us, although his heavy breathing was cause for worry. I hoped he wouldn't have a heart attack. We still needed him. I wasn't being callous and thinking this. The mission was all important. God, did I actually think that? I guess I did. Arlene had converted me, and I didn't even know when she managed it. My goal had shifted from rescuing her to fighting the last battle as the last marine. I blew the door off its hinges with a point-blank shotgun blast. One of the spinies didn't approve of my house breaking. It dive-bombed me and flung a ball of burning mucus that just missed. Just missed me, that is. Arlene took it out, but then I glanced over at Rich and saw that the imp had done him serious damage. Rich had taken a faceful of the poison and was coughing his guts up. Holding the door open with my back, I raked and fired as fast as I could and Arlene dragged Rich inside. Vindication. The room was full of electronic gear, cables, data banks. While well, Arlene did what she could for Rich, damned little under the circumstances, I stood guard on all four doors, shooting anything that ventured close. Naturally, the monsters couldn't fire back. I enjoyed the situation until one of the imps flung a spitwad and hit the door frame, missing me by a hand's breadth. For one moment in the history of the universe, the spider mind and yours truly shared the same opinion. The imp's action was ill-considered in the extreme. The spider mind proved it was no dummy. It blew the imp to cutlets. I drifted from doorway to doorway, and nothing shot at me. However, every time I passed within line of sight of the spider mind, I caught another face full of hypnotic horror. It was the only weapon the critter had left. In a way, you had to feel sorry for it. Well, maybe not. How's it going? I asked Arlene, already knowing the answer. She shook her head. Rich was in a lot worse shock than when we first found him. The flaming goo had stuck to his face, catching him just as he inhaled. His lungs were fried. They could no longer transport oxygen to his blood. I didn't know what we were going to do. Maybe a hospital could save him, but we didn't even have bandages or painkiller. The skin of his face was angry red, 
and it was bleeding in a dozen spots where enough layers of epidermis had burned away. He must have been in agony, and Rich knew it was hopeless, for him at least. He was a smart man. Bill was dying. Arlene propped him against a wall and whispered in his ear. He nodded, making the coughing worse, but she wiped his eyes, and he could see well enough to help us. In a weak voice, he began identifying critical components within the room. He remembered everything from when they forced him to work on the mess. He told us what we needed to know. Arlene left him propped against the wall and came to me. In a low voice, she said, I wish we had one of those blue spheres right now. It's the only thing that would save him. I agreed. We don't even have a medikit. At least I could make him comfortable. I looked her in the eye. He told us what we need to know, I said. That's the important thing. I felt professional. I felt several degrees colder than mean. But Arlene was as much a pro as I. Do you want to perform the coup de gras on this energy conduit? Or shall I? While I thought about it, she made up my mind for me. You'd better do it, Fly. We need a real sharpshooter's eye to keep those bastards far enough away that they can't reach in and grab us. I suppose even you can't miss a computer bank from two meters away, hey? Even if you can't shoot an apple off Goforth's head. She grinned. I turned and became a one-man wrecking crew. Raising the BFG, I took a deep breath and let fly at the collection of electronics. The explosion knocked me on my butt. I staggered up and took out the rest of the targets Rich pointed out in the mass of equipment. After four walloping shots, the BFG fizzled and wouldn't shoot anymore. Out of juice, I finished the job with a dozen shotgun shells. Jesus, Fly! Come look at this! Arlene shouted. I came, still shaking, ears still ringing like Christmas. This was turning into an hour of surprises. The monsters were acting like they were on PCP, wandering in circles and firing at anything that moved, which meant each other. The spider mind still seemed to have control over its ugly faculties. It opened fire on several of the Hell Princes, no doubt with the idea of removing those of its minions most potentially dangerous if there were no way to give them orders. Naturally, the executions drew the attention of other monsters. They fired at the noise. We weren't cast members in that show, but we took full advantage of our backstage passes. Fifteen minutes later, there was one monster, count him, one monster left that we could see. For the moment, the spider mind was boss over itself, and it had one other problem besides not being able to get any decent help. The gun cylinder spun empty. The spider hadn't saved any ammo for us. Rich, Arlene said, speaking quietly but enunciating clearly. Your plan worked brilliantly. I'm sure he would have appreciated her good opinion of him, if he had still been alive. The damned stupid Spiny had killed him after all. I stared at the dead face of Bill Rich, the captivity and torture survivor, comrade, the man who gave us a real chance to defeat the alien invaders. I looked at this brand new corpse and something snapped. I'm sick of this, I told Arlene. I shrugged off my beloved rocket launcher and handed it to my best gal pal. Keep an eye on me first class. You'll know when to use it. And don't, god damn it, miss. Show me the apple, Flynn Taggart, and I'll pop it off your head. I loaded up my shotgun, for attention grabbing purposes only and calmly walked out to face the ugliest alien of them all. Hey, spider baby, I called out. Yeah, I'm talking to you. The turret turned. The spider mind and I looked at each other, and suddenly I was overwhelmed with the most horrific vision of all. I saw the earth in flames, burning buildings, fields, oceans of corpses. I saw the demons, 
not just aliens, but honest to Lucifer demons, wading through the rivers of filth and blood and urine, laughing in triumph. I saw mankind under the heel, collars around our throats, chains on wrists and ankles. I saw collaborators, traitors, turncoats of every race and culture. I saw a Vichy Earth government, and I saw in the distance an endless parade of bigger and more ghastly demons. They filled the land from end to end, sea to shining sea. And I knew this vision was no nightmare plucked from my own subconscious fears. This was reality. I saw the future, and I leaned forward and spat upon the shredded machine mind. Remember the imp you had talked to me back on Phobos? That creepy leather face asked for my surrender. Well, here's my answer, you insect. Raising my shotgun, I took careful aim and blasted toward the brain inside the crystal case. Then I did it again, and again, and again. I stopped at eight shots because I'd run out of shells, because the turret had finally rotated in my direction and was chewing up the deck plates with 30 millimeter rounds. I sailed through the heaped corpses, looking for one in particular. One body not dead, but pre-born as my nuns would say though in a hell of a different context. I was looking for my steam demon, and that had to be a first. The spider mind scuttled after me. On open ground, it could make quite a clip, quite a bit faster than a mere two-legger like me. But we weren't on open ground. I chose my route well. I leapt from body to body like Eliza across the ice flows and the frustrated arachnoid android started shooting the corpses out of the way for clearer footing. I put some distance between us, and for a moment, the stupid thing lost me. Great. I should have brought an air horn. Crouching so I wouldn't get clopped by a stray, I loaded up, stood, and fired a few more shells. It spotted me, screamed in triumph just like you'd expect an insect to sound magnified a billion times, and charged, Gatling barrels spinning like gyroscopes. I ran the hundred and world record time. I flung myself through the air in a graceful swan dive, tucked at the last second, and rolled beautifully, dislocating my shoulder. I struggled up, shifted the shotgun to my right, weak hand, reached over the steam demon, and let fly with the last shell. My cough was answered by a diarrhea of Vulcan cannon rounds that tore up the iron flesh of the steam demon like an AB-10 tears up plaster. The bullets ripped the legs apart. They ripped the head apart. They ripped the missiles apart. I clenched my teeth. Now was the moment of truth. If they'd already attached those warheads, well, I guess I'd either go north and meet the nuns, or or stay right where I was, in hell. Fifteen seconds and 750 rounds later, sudden silence startled me back to the here and now. My ears throbbed and rang. My skull felt like it was still vibrating, but the spider mind had stopped shooting to see what damage it had done. I wasn't about to stick my head up, but I didn't need to. I closed my eyes and sniffed deeply. There is a smell most people don't know, but once you've tasted it, you never forget it. Anyone who's hung around a marine air base or naval air station remembers, and pilots remember from the airport. It's the pungent aroma of JP-9 jet propellant, and it tears through your septum, up your nasal passages, and straight into your brain. Think of ammonia, formaldehyde, and skunk juice swirled together into a malt. There was no possibility of error. Dozens of gallons of the burn juice pooled around the steam demon. In fact, looking down, I saw it seeping from under the body onto my side, eating away at my boots worse than the green sludge. My bruised eardrums were trying to tell me something urgent, a sound behind the ringing and throbbing. 
clicking feet. The spider mind was on its way to investigate. I backed slowly away, crouching lower and lower to stay behind the steam demon. Then the spider mind loomed, and I could no longer hide. It screamed again, this time in rage, not triumph, and charged. It slipped in the fuel slick that it itself had created. It tried to rise and slipped again, skating in the horrible stuff. JP-9 dripped from the spider mind's underbelly, splashed up and down its legs, even sprayed across the crystal canopy. Time to split that apple, A.S. I dashed to the side, waving frantically at the building. I couldn't see Arlene. I pointed at the spider mind, screaming, Now! Now! You crazy bitch! She couldn't hear me, of course, or I never would have said such a thing. A tiny bud of red bloomed in the black doorway, flowering into the bright red tail exhaust of our very last rocket. I hit the deck, hands overhead, belatedly wondering whether any of the jet propellant had sprayed on me. I barely heard the explosion through the ringing, but the force kicked me in my dislocated shoulder. After a moment with my eyes shut, arms locked over my head, I ventured a glance. The spider mind screeched and skittered, joyously engulfed in bright white flames, like one of Weem's monks protesting the war in Kafiristan by immolating himself with burning gasoline. I watched for several minutes, keeping low as the last of the spider mind's ammo exploded, bursting off in all directions. Mobility lasted only half a minute. Then the intense heat melted the crystal canopy, turning the truck-sized brain into a crispy critter in seconds. It took longer for the metal body to liquefy, even longer for the whole mass to bubble through the melted deck plates. At last, there was nothing left of the dreaded spider mind but a smoking crater. Get used to it, I muttered, unable to even hear my own voice. Think of this as rehearsal for the next eternity. A hand grabbed my arm, my left arm, no! I screamed. Then I screamed again in pain as Arlene yanked on my dislocated shoulder. Jesus, Fly, I'm sorry. I faintly heard her voice, as if through a speakerphone across the room. I rolled onto my back, swearing like a drunken longshoreman. Oh, she said. I see what it is. Hang on, Fly. This is gonna hurt, but you'll thank me for it in a minute. Would you believe she grabbed my biceps, pulled my arm out of the socket, and snapped it back into place? I passed out. I came to in a few seconds, then cursed her out again, sorting the epithets alphabetically. In case I missed any. I passed through the scatological and had started on the blasphemous when she shut me up by planting a big, wet boot heel on my mouth. She sat me up. By then, my ears were starting to recover and I could hear what she said. Pretty spectacular, Fly. I guess we won. Rich would have loved this spread now. But still, I heard the hum of power. The lights remained lit. Something was wrong with this picture. I hope you won't take this wrong, said Arlene, staring curiously around. But why aren't we plunged into terrible darkness, Fly Taggart? I know what you mean. A.S. We can't feel total satisfaction until we're freezing to death in the black night of space. And running out of air. So, what's gone wrong with Bill Rich's plan? She frowned in thought. I guess that building didn't house the power receiver after all, she said. It must have been the communications gear by which the spider mind was controlling all the other creatures. You mean... All the creatures left on Deimos and Phobos will destroy one another, like these guys did. I smiled. I liked that thought. The spider mind was barely able to control them as it was, she pointed out. They have a natural hatred for each other. I remembered the crucified Hell Princes. Then I remembered Bill, dying from the stupid blast from a stupid imp. Now he was gone. Focus, Fly focus. 
We went back in the control room and I threw a piece of canvas over Rich. We laid his body out in the place that was the most appropriate crypt. The scene of his victory over the demons. All right, I said. I think we should retrace our steps back to the surface of Deimos. Maybe we can figure out how to get back to Mars from there. Or at least figure out where in hell we are. Watch your language, Arlene said seriously. Hmm. Arlene Sanders, with religion. As we worked our way back up through the level of Deimos, we found the dead bodies of hundreds, then thousands, of the alien monsters. It was as if the Cosmic Orkin Company had come through and done a big special on demonic infestation. There were a few live ones, so completely out of it that they hardly seemed worth killing. Somehow Arlene and I found the will to exterminate them anyway. When we reached the surface, we discovered the pressure dome was cracked, the air rushing out, creating a mini hurricane. Of course, we had been adequately briefed on the basics of life in space. It would take days for all the air to escape. We weren't planning to wait around that long. I looked past the crack and stopped breathing. I stared so long, forgetting to blink, that my eyes blurred. I wasn't staring at Mars anymore, where Mars had loomed, hanging over our heads like a wrecking ball, was a different planet, one that looked disturbingly familiar. Blue-green, familiar land masses, cloud cover, teeming with six billion cousins and uncles. We weren't in a hyperspace tunnel any longer. We looked for several minutes hoping it was a shared hallucination. At last, Arlene said, I guess we know their invasion plans now. As I stared at Earth in the skies of Deimos, through a cracked and broken pressure dome, I felt a queer sense of dislocation, as if I were no longer setting inside my own body, but standing alongside. I shook, as if I had a terrible fever, mindlessly clutching at my uniform. Weems uniform. Well, I began feebly, at least we stopped them. Did we? She reached out, as if trying to pet the planet. Beyond the domes, amid the bright flecked black of space, other bright spots flared upon the continents, shining through the scattered clouds. Nuclear explosions would look just like that. Other things, worse things, could look like that as well. Jesus, they've already invaded, Arlene said, hope draining away from her voice faster than the escaping air. I took her by the arm and said, It's not over, Arlene. We've already proven who's tougher. We won't let it end like this. But we had no ship, no radio, not even a really long rope. We were stuck in low orbit around Earth, a mere 400 kilometers away, hanging over our heads like the biggest balloon we could ever hope to play with. I shut my eyes tight, then opened them. How would we do the impossible? How could we jump 400 kilometers to Earth and kill the orbital velocity? We didn't say anything for a very long time. We watched the white spots appearing over the northern hemisphere, over the hot, blue oceans and cool green hills of Earth. Suddenly, Arlene gasped. Her eyes opened wide. Fly! I have it! What? I know how to do it! Do what, damn it? Her lips moved, silently calculating. Then she grinned. I know how to get us across to Earth. Fly. <laughs>